I don't think I charged enough. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you want me to start, Richard? Are we all right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead. I guess that's what they call the cheap seats up there. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you the story of the Great Black Swamp. It's one of the wonders of the history of this lovely town that we live in, of Perrysburg. And I want to tell you, I love Perrysburg. What a great place to live. I mean, look at what we have here. Beautiful homes, beautiful quiet streets. Never get in a traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely churches, wonderful parks, and the best schools around. And you could get any place from here, even to Sylvania in 2025 minutes, except for the detours now. <laughs> that doesn't count. But, but I just think this is a great town to live in. And I, it's evident it's growing too damn fast. <laughs> But I'm constantly amazed at how much history, levels of history, we have right here in Northwest Ohio. 600 million years ago, this planet was covered with warm saltwater seas. The future continents and land masses were just beginning to form. And what we know is Northwest Ohio, where we're sitting right today, was at that time actually south of the equator, underwater. Let's go back to the Ice Age. Around for one and a half million years, the glaciers, two miles thick, covered much of the planet. As I mentioned before, before the time of the glaciers, this whole area was a warm saltwater sea. So much of the Earth's water was frozen in the glaciers that the world's oceans actually dropped 300 feet. When the glaciers melted, the oceans filled up again, eventually. A huge lake covered all of southeast Michigan and northwest Ohio, 100 feet higher than Lake Erie is today. So don't even talk to me about global warming and global cooling. I mean, God's been doing this for a long time. The end result of the glaciers melting was Lake Erie, the oak openings, and the Great Black Swamp. The Great Black Swamp, all of it south of the Maumee River, spread over 12 northwest Ohio counties, roughly from Fremont to Fort Wayne. Wood and Pawnee counties are the only two counties completely in the area of the swamp. The swamp was about 40 miles wide to 120 miles long, about the size of Connecticut, believe it or not, almost 5,000 square miles. Now, if you look at a map, if you want to see where it was, look at a map of Ohio, northern Ohio. The cities of Sandusky, Fremont, Astoria, Delphus, Finley, Fort Wayne, Defiance, and Toledo. That perimeter is exactly the perimeter of the Great Black Swamp that nobody built in it. Only one city was ever built in the Great Black Swamp, Bowling Green. And you know why? Because they had those sand ridges. Sand Ridge Road, that's where they put the city. The only city built in the swamp. But you, if you want to know where the swamp was, just look at a map and look where the cities are. Our rich farmland of northwest Ohio was once this vast tract of marsh and swamp, known as the most miserable area in the USA, if not the whole world. Covered by water most of the year, except for the very dry summers, or when frozen solid during a very, very cold winter, travel through the swamp was almost impossible, at very best. Pioneers streaming westward in the late 1700s, early 1800s, detoured around northwest Ohio in the Black Swamp, so it remained pristine, if you want to call it that word, I'm not sure that's a good word. <laughs> Inhabited only by a few Indians and the occasional white hunters and traders. However, by 1830, most of the land east of the Mississippi River had been acquired by settlers. The early settlers on the edges of the swamp, trying to develop the area as a last resort, 
paid a steep price. Summer brought swarming clouds of mosquitoes. To ward them off, the settlers had to perspire in thick woolen clothing, mittens, head wraps, and scarves, and with their poor horses covered with blankets, just because of the mosquitoes. Smoke hugged the ground in the evening as smudge pots lit to keep the mosquitoes away. The nights were filled with a croaking of thousands and thousands of frogs, <laughs> accented by the howling of wolves and the screeching of owls. They had to try and protect their sheep and cattle and chickens from the wolves, and at the same time, try not to get bitten by a rattlesnake. But the worst warm weather affliction was the dreaded ague, or swamp fever, which flattened its victims with soaring fevers, deep chills, and violent shaking. They would shake a whole house. Whole families were often victims. One observer said of the swamp, perhaps the most unhealthy place on the whole continent is the great black swamp. As winter approached, settlers got a respite from ague and mosquitoes only to cope with the sordid hardships that came with the long, cold, and dark months spent in a remote frontier city. In spring, hope always sprang eternal, along with epic amounts of water and mud brought by rain and melting snows. Many gave up and left, but more arrived. These hardy folks were determined to wage war with the swamp and win. Cholera epidemics happened often, and the cholera epidemic of 1854 wiped out thousands of early pioneers and settlers, and at the same time wiped out half of the citizens of the village of Perrysburg. Story circulated about an unscrupulous undertaker who was dumping bodies into a mass grave so that he could reuse their caskets. Going about his duties, he found a body in the street, gathered it up, and disposed of it in the mass grave with everybody else. He arrived later with a new load, only to discover the man sitting on a fence, <laughs> wondering what the hell happened to him. He had barely been sleeping off a drunk. <laughs> and was most anxious to get back to town and pick up where he'd left off. <laughs> there were few medicines in those dark days, but large amounts of whiskey were used to fight off the ague and the shakes and the chills. One of the favorite med medicines was called Hostetler's Stomach Bitters. Were common. And fortunately, were those who had quinine, the really only true medicine that would work. Many old patent medicines were used in the Maumee Valley, and many contained poisons like mercury, trichinin, and something else I forgot. <laughs> many early settlers gave up and left. Their empty cabins were mute monuments to the limits of human endurance. One Wood County pioneer was murdered by his wife for refusing to take her out of the swamp. And this swamp of ours played a key role in our military history here. I've stated many times in my history talks, the three most important battles ever fought on U.S. soil against a foreign enemy all happened right here within 40 miles. The Battle of Fallen Timbers with Matt Anthony Wayne who was a tough guy. The sieges and battles of Fort Meigs with General William Henry Harrison. And of course, the very successful battle of Lake Erie, Lake Erie with Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry. We're all hampered by the traveling conditions of the Black Swamp to get them here. Their letters back home tried to discourage anyone from trying to take on the Black Swamp. But the settlers kept coming, for there was land to be had and dreams to be realized. Even if the land they dreamed about was underwater most of the year, they were determined to wage war against the swamp and win. Now it took a good woodsman with an ax at least a month to fell the trees on one acre. And then he had to remove the logs and get rid of the stumps before he could claim anything. Trees were felled, wild animals were killed off, and drainage projects were undertaken in earnest. The felled trees could not be removed until the swamp, swamp froze solid in the wintertime, at which time they had huge slaves drawn by horses to drag them out. 
draining an area the size of the Black Swamp, which is, all, as I said, almost the size of Connecticut, proved to be easier said than done, and a hodgepodge of, pot of, of early efforts accomplished very little. I want to shift gears here for a moment and tell you about one of my favorite heroes who spent much of his life in and around the swamp, and that's a fellow by the name of Peter Navarre. Navarre was a fur trapper and a trader who lived his entire life on the eastern shore of the Maumee River in East, what is now East Toledo near what we call the High Level Bridge today. He was an educated man, descendant of both the kings of France and Spain. He spent his life in and near the swamp and knew, the, knew it like the back of his hand. His knowledge of the area and his ability to know the Indians and their dialects proved invaluable during the War of 1812 when General William Henry Harrison made, him, made Navarre his chief spy and scout. Those familiar with Toledo will recognize that Nar Navarre Avenue was Peter's trail to the big woods, what we now call Pearson Park, then a part of, which was a part of the Great Black Swamp, of course. Peter did much of his hunting and trapping there. Navarre had a price on his head from the British of $1,000, which was a pretty princely sum in 1812. So he led a cautious life, especially when near the Indians. Because they were the partners of the British, of course. They were the enemy. One story goes that Navarre was on a risky mission with a young companion going through the stop swamp when they stopped for a night in the swamp. The young man wanted to start a fire to warm up his supper. And he begged and begged. And finally, uh, he, the young man also noticed how many owls were hooting. Finally, the bar relented, built a small fire, and hurriedly hid his companion and himself in some thickets nearby. Soon a prowling Indian came into view. There's your owl, grumbled the bar, the subject of a fire not come up again. The bar was with General Harrison at the siege of Fort Meigs. Being, he was warned that the British and their Indian allies under Chief Tecumseh of the Shawnees were about to attack Fort Stevenson in Fremont, Ohio, then known at the time as Lower Sandusky. I bet you always wondered where Lower Sandusky was. We all know where Upper Sandusky was. It used to be Fremont until we changed the name. And Harrison sent Navarre to warn Colonel Krogan, who was famous in Fremont, of course, and Navarre left at sundown in a raging thunderstorm for the 30-mile journey through the swamp. To say the least, it was a perilous journey with a $1,000 bounty on its head, a snapped twig could bring certain death. Traveling all night and the next day, he dodged Indians on several occasions, had to swim the Sandusky River twice to avoid detection, and he covered the 30 miles through the swamp in the pouring rain in 44 hours under horrible conditions. Peter Navarre is also the man who delivered Perry's famous message after the Battle of Lake Erie, which we celebrated a couple years ago. I quote, we have met the enemy and they are ours after a brisk battle. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner and one sloop, which Navarre delivered to General Harrison on the shore. That's kind of interesting as a sidelight. You go to the you know, some people say, well, the Battle of Lake Erie wasn't a big deal. Well, it was a big deal. It was the first time in the history of the British Empire that their fleet had lost an entire battle. First time in history that they lost an entire battle. And not only lose the battle, but Perry captured all of their ships intact. He didn't sink them, he captured them. And all you had to do was put a new flag on them, you had a new boat. <laughs> Save the money. But if you go to, if you go to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, there are only two models that the sailors use to this day. Don't give up the ship, and we have met the enemy, and they are ours. And they came from our battle on Lake Erie. In 1811, the government determined to make a road for the 31 miles from Lower Sandusky and Perrysburg. The mud along the road proved to be of epic proportions. And the more the route was used, the more of a quagmire it became. That's logical. 
Taverns were spaced about every mile. <laughs> a good, which was a good day's travel at that time. Which provided food and lodging, and most importantly, teams of strong oxen to pull the wagons out of the mud. Small fortunes were made by the tavern owners. If a tavern owner didn't have a good mud hole nearby, he'd make one so he could keep his oxen busy and profitable. A careful observer will take note of the mile markers on Route 20 to Fremont. I think this is fascinating. Every mile on the north side of Route 20, there's a mile marker carved from limestone, triangular in shape. One side says P6LS25. That's the 31 miles. LS being lower Sandusky, P being Perrysburg. There's one of those every mile. Now, there's, most of those are still left. There's a lot of them still left. And if you're not aware of that, you should really pay attention. Drive out through 20 and look for those mile markers on the north side of the road. I think it's fascinating, a piece of history that's still here that they hand carved back in all those years. One pioneer was so upset of having to spend his life savings of $100 paying to be pulled out of these mud holes that he dug his own mud hole and earned the money back and then moved on. <laughs> Now, when you drive from Perrysburg, it's a nice and easy 31-mile drive to Fremont, but not in the 1800s. About 1808, the government realized that something had to be done to make this journey passable. In 1823, Congress authorized a road to be built called the Maumee and Western Road. It began as a log road, a corduroy road, they called it. And, of course, they continued to sink in the mud. Side ditches were added, which just complicated the matter. And a series of ditch laws helped to begin the drainage of this huge swamp. It became obvious that the draining of the swamp was essential to the, the first underground drains were crude. Farmers dug trenches and just filled them with brush and stones to drain the water away from their fields. Uh, and then sometimes they got fancier and they did two boards with like an upside down tee. Uh, tent uh, to drain the water. Sometimes they got in awful fights because if they drained it into their farmer's yard next door, uh, didn't like it. They didn't think much of that. Clay tile was the best product to use to drain the fields, but it was too expensive. It had to all come from Pennsylvania. Finally, this is fascinating. Finally, in 1860, they discovered a huge bed of clay under the mud, which was in fact holding the water in. It seems that the solution to the problem was in fact the problem. Dozens of clay tile factories immediately sprung up all over this area, and I can still remember one near, near the bridge over the uh, western side of Perrysburg. At the same time, the government passed the ditch laws. The swamp began to drain. Over 15,000 miles of ditches were dug in Wood County alone. Where we all live, 15,000. We had more miles of ditches than we had roads. Thousands of miles were ditches that were dug, were dug to ditch to solve the biggest drainage project in the world. Steam Buckeye trenchers finally brought steam power to the project to speed it up. Five million acres of new farmland was opened up for the settlement. By 1930, the once uninhabitable Black Swamp was mo the most heavily cropped area in Ohio. And to this day, we have the richest soil in the state. While no new ditches have been dug since 1920, now listen to this, Wood County still maintains, or if they take care of, over 3,000 miles of ditches to this day. The, one, the whole area, once 90% forest, is now known for its flat horizon, straight roads, and deep, deep ditches. There are only a few remnants of the original Black Swamp still here. Pearson Park, which is half settled uh, with, park, with walkways and stuff, 
uh, was part of the park with a forum. And he still and and then at the Gall Woods, which is west of here, is a part of the early uh, part of the of the swamp, still intact, but it has walkways through it. And then of course there's Metzger and the Gee Marshes, the Ottawa Wildlife Area, along the shore of Lake Erie. The only other exception is a small stand of rolling wet forest tucked out of sight in Paulding County and preserved by its owners over the years. This is the only piece of the Great Black Swamp that still exists as <coughs> God made it. Its existence was known only to those who lived nearby. Its most recent owner, Claire Forrest, bought it in the 50s and was his desire that the land should remain in its natural state forever. His family sold the land to the Black Swamp Conservancy, who put a conservation easement on the forest to protect it in perpetuity. It's called the Forest Woods Nature Preserve. There are no paths, no trails. You have to get special permission from Black Swamp even to go look at it. We've added several hundred acres contiguous to this forest to expand it down to the river. The flood, the flood plains of this area were carved by the Marine Alarm Creek, which drains the northwestern corner of this Pauling, Pauling County wet forest. Over, over 550 animals and plant species have been identified in this beautiful forest, and over 100 bird, see, bird species have been documented. Now, the demise of game birds and mammals is well documented and kind of interesting. Wood cutting and hunting soon eliminated most game species. The last deer, now listen to this, the last deer was killed in Ohio in 1889. Pause. Deer were reintroduced in the early 20th century. I guess we all know how that worked out. <laughs> Bison and elk were here and they vanished in the early 1800s. Beaver were gone from the Maumee Valley by 1837. River otters left early on and the last pair of cougars were killed in 1845 while well, lynxes and wolverines about the same time. Gray wolves and bears died out in 1869. Forest woods is the only piece that has been untouched by civilization. Let me explain what a conservation easement is. It's an agreement between a landowner and the Black Swamp Conservancy either through purchase or donation, that attaches to the title and prevents that land to be developed in any way forever. Now let me explain. Forever is a very, very long time, especially towards the end. <laughs> Black Fawn Conservancy has protected over 20,000 acres of Northwest Ohio lands, which are protected from development forever. Black Swamp Conservancy is, this is the commercial folks, I'm sorry. The Black Swamp Conservancy is celebrating its 25th year this year. We have protected over 120 pieces of land, composed of some of the most beautiful land and scenery in Northwest Ohio. It was started by a lady that some of you have heard of named Diddy Stranahan, who gave us the 577 Foundation. She wanted to be sure that her estate on the river was not subdivided like so many of the others have been. And she was a driving force, and she picked people like me and, and a nephew of hers who was an attorney and several others to, uh, to see that this happened, that we protected her land first and foremost, which we did. I think one other person hired the last of the founders that are still around. We protected over 120 pieces of beautiful land some of the most beautiful land and scenery in Northwest Ohio. Our grandchildren and their grandchildren will be able to see what we enjoy today. 16,000 acres of forest, meadows, and water, scenery, farms, and riverfronts. And we've had more every day. We're very proud of the support that we've received from farmers, other landowners, and friends 
who want to see some of Ohio's best lands protected from development. Let me tell you something. Over five, over 400 acres every day are covered up by buildings and asphalt in the state of Ohio. 400 acres a day. You don't think we got have a print problem with expansion? Where was I? <coughs> Oh, here we go. So we can't waste time. We must save some of these beautiful landscapes, lake and river shores, open scenery, farms, whatever, forests, for our grandchildren and their grandchildren to see. Getting covered up too fast. The forest wood is only one of the nature, only one of our many properties that make us particularly proud. We have over 500 acres of, on Peninsula Farms near Fremont, with over two and a half miles of frontage on the Sandusky River, wilderness, home to several bald eagle nests, and other wildlife. Ohio's first white couple are buried on this farm, where they used to run a, a wilderness store for the, for the uh, Indians. The, far, the uh, farm of the Sisters of St. Francis, on the edge of town, we protected 500 acres there. It took me 10 years to get that piece of land. You know, it's just not easy. You don't just happen. You just sit with the sisters in their board meetings. It's a little out of place, but... <laughs> a branch of the Black Swamp Conservancy operates on the Bass Islands out by Clinton Bay. So we've saved many parcels there in the, in the islands. There aren't many left. Hardly any land is out there anymore. I hope that these remarks give you a better feel for what life was like in Perrysburg's earliest days and what we're looking forward to. And I would be welcome to any questions you may have. Yes? Uh, the forest conservancy that you mentioned in Fulton County. Yeah. Uh, two questions. How many acres is it? And is that considered sufficient to maintain the original character of the Black Swamp? Well, it was when we got it, it was about 150 acres. We've added to it. Some of it's farms and some of it's riverfront. We're on the Maumee and so forth. We're trying to make it a bigger piece to protect it even more. But when it started, it was 150 acres. And Mr. Forrest was, we paid well over a million dollars. A million three, I think, for it. Uh, but we did, we got the help in the state and so forth. But it's safe. And it's the only piece that really is untraveled at all. No paths, no walking. And is that, is that big enough? that you won't get invasive species moving in and destroying Well, so far we haven't. Original character. So far we haven't. It's been there a long time. So nobody gets to go in. If there's invasive species, that's what God does. I mean, I'm not going to stop them. <laughs> yes? Well, Perrysburg and Maumee and Toledo were on the northern edge of the swamp. Perrysburg was the dry end. That's where they were trying to get to from Fremont to cross the, the narrowest part of the Black Swamp. So Perrysburg, as you know, started in 1860, and I think Maumee the next year, and Toledo in 1831. But uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that's how they developed. Perrysburg was still you know, fascinating. I mean, Major Amos Stafford was the only guy here, and, and Washington told him to lay on a town one mile square at the foot of the rapids, of the, what they called then the Miami River, we call it the Maumee, and to name it after Perry. They're pretty simple instructions. And he did. And you know, the original map of, of Perrysburg that he was given to lay out of the town by. Those streets are same, they're still the same, the alleys are the same, the lots are the same size, the street names are the same, nothing has changed in all those years for this little town of ours. Now it's bigger now, we didn't have the boundary streets in that way, the miles are smaller in than that. But, yes sir. Uh, oh, Jeff. Yes, 
do you know when the uh, Corduroy Road, the Fremont Pike, was uh, finally paved? Oh, about 1855, I would guess. Well, that way. I'm guessing. I mean, they, they went through paving several times. Yeah. But most of it sunk, so they repave it. <laughs> and put more logs and more asphalt and more uh, uh, stuff on it. It was just a constant irritating problem. The world's worst, world's worst road for years. Yes, sir. Yeah. Of that land you said you got, that you set aside for for packing. Now, what stops from in the future where developments come in and say, well, eminent domain, they want to buy the, to get the land and, and take it away and, and develop it? They have to get the title of Bowling Green or wherever. And the title has got an attachment on it that says this conservation easement applies to this in perpetuity. Right. Forever. Okay. So they buy it with that known condition and you can't change it. Okay. You can't change it. When 577 wants the, the 577 Foundation, which was our first uh, piece, as I told you, the Stranahan thing, when they want to change a shutter, they got to come and ask his permission. If it's out, if it's inside the boundary, but they were very hard nosed about it. Because a lot, because a lot of places that when cities start expanding, they claim that they don't mean. No, you can't do that. Domain, right? It cannot be done. We have right. farmers that sell or give us their land for a conservation easement. If they sell it, they make a profit. They give it to us. They get long years of tax write off, and they have got their kids to agree to this that not, that they want to keep farming. There may be four generations from now, some kid says, I don't want it. I want to build a house here and sell it to Bowling Green. He can't do it. His grandpa did this. It, you cannot change it. Trust me. Okay. Yes, sir. The, uh, was any of the, any of the drainage other than to the Maumee River, was it any of the drainage to the south of the swamp? Well, the portage and the Sandusky were part of the issue, of course, drainage. That, they all had ditches going into the rivers, which went into the lake. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I, I'm, I live on, on Hull Prairie, and the Hull Prairie ditch runs forever, but, you know, I don't, how, does it stop at Bowling Green? Uh, <coughs> I'm trying to think, I don't know. I didn't figure, I just, the engineering of that is just fascinating. I, I don't know. Do you know, sir? No. Oh, you're going to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Uh, two questions, actually. Which Indians were here? And then I heard that they tried to build a railroad across the Great Black Swamp at one time. Yeah, they did, it sank. <laughs> <laughs> the Indians that were here, there were so many tribes, Potawatomis and Shawnees and I can't name them all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm six, 89 years old. I can't remember stuff. <laughs> but there were lots of them. But the chief of all was Chief Tecumseh. He was the head chief over all the other tribes around here in this whole part of the, of the world. And he was an amazing man, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, if he were not an Indian, if he were a white man, you'd say he was a real Christian gentleman. When he was 12 years old, Chief Tecumseh was born under the shooting star, so there's, there's something connection with his name. Uh, he witnessed when he was a little boy, somebody burn a white man at the stake of life. And he said, that isn't right. Now the Indians, this is what they did. They killed people, they scalped people. Chief Tecumseh, for all of his power, said that is not gonna happen ever under my watch. Which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And Chief Tecumseh, in the War of 1812, when, what's his name? What, what's the name of the massacre in, in, uh, by the Maumee Library? Dudley. Huh? Dudley. Dudley's, Dudley's massacre. Colonel Dudley, by being greedy and thinking he could go further than he should have, got entrapped by the Indians, and of course they were all murdered. And What was the claim? Oh, it's a come thing. When, when, when uh, Harrison chased 
the English, they went up to the Detroit and then to Antwerp, Michigan, or Canada, and he chased them up the parallel to the, what they call the River Thames, which parallel Lake Erie pretty much. And the British were not fighting, they were just running on, uh, with horse and wagon, and Harrison's trying to keep up with them with his soldiers on foot. And so Perry went along parallel in the water with his ship to carry all their supplies so they wouldn't have to carry them during the day. And at that, where they, they stopped, the British finally stopped the fight at a place called Monrovian Town uh, on the River Thames. And they didn't fight much. The, the, the officers escaped on horseback and left their soldiers to die. And Tecumseh, with his men, was fighting a battle with the Americans over here. And that's where Tecumseh died. He was killed there. About 12 people took credit for it. Everybody, including Peter DeMar, said, oh, I thought I had shot him. Well, who knows? We think the guy that became vice president of the United States eventually shot him. But, and they took Tecumseh's body away so that we couldn't have it. Indians took it, and we don't, nobody ever knew where they put it. This is kind of interesting, but Chief Tecumseh was a very special guy, I thought. that do it? Yes, ma'am. Are there any future plans to protect those high on the coast? Well, this guy right here might know. So, are there any plans? I mean, they're, I mean, they're either there or they're not. Well, uh, into that, uh, the story of Perrysburg, I wrote a book with another fellow, it was published by Historic Perrysburg. It, it tells the history of the Mall and Western Reserve Road and the training of the swamp. And that book will be available at Harrison Rally Days at Historic Perrysburg's uh, Marshall. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. Uh, I forgot your question was. Uh, no. But we will. This book documents every the condition, every mile marker, and what it's in. And I talked one day to several people from monument companies about preserving the stones, and nobody seemed to know anything about how to do that. And we were particularly interested in preserving the one that's in Milestone Park, right here in town. Yeah. And, but uh, some of them actually did replace the concrete. Yeah. I think most of the landowners that have one of the originals. They're pretty protective of it. Yeah, they're on the property. They're, they're on their property. They're going to take good care of it. But some of them in development have just disappeared. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. I appreciate it.